Okay, then what I'd like to go on to now is a discussion about uh, Monte Carlo techniques in simulations. So suppose I had a coin and I wanted to test if the coin was fair. Is it really a 50% chance of heads or tails? One way that I could test is to run an experiment where I estimate the probability of heads by tossing the coin many times and counting how many times a head appears. This is what is called a Monte Carlo test. Okay? I actually go out and try it and measure how many times. So this gets me an estimate of the probability. Intuitively, I know that if I toss the coin once or twice, it's not going to give me a very good estimate. The more I toss it, the better my estimate of the probability of heads will get. You should run an experiment you know, many, many times. Just You know intuitively that uh, you have to uh, get a um, informative amount of samples. And what I'd like to talk about now is how do I know how many samples are enough to draw. So we want to take the Monte Carlo technique and apply it to communication systems. So of course that means that I, I come in, I have some bits at the input, I put them into my system, I have a transmitter, I add some noise to it, I'll put red. This is my input. My random input is the noise. And then I put it through my numerical simulator where I have a channel, some sort of channel response. And then I'll have some receiver. I'm testing. I get out something called a decision statistic. I have a decision rule which makes me pick what bit was sent. So here I have a bit estimate. So this is what my Monte Carlo simulator will do. It will generate bits. It will generate noise samples. It will run them through this numerical simulator where each one of these boxes is implemented uh, numerically. And then since I'm in a simulator, I know what the real bits were. I know what the bit estimates were. And I just ask the question, was it right? Was the decision I made correct? And if not, I count the errors. And I estimate the bit error rate as being the number of errors divided by the number of trials. So I can use uh, this approach in any numerical simulator, be it MATLAB or Opti system, to help me estimate the bit error rate whenever I'm using uh, a system which is not ideal in some way, where my analytical equations are no longer valid. Um, sometimes it's just impossible to come up with closed form solutions in these uh, situations. But in there, so in this way, the numerical simulator uh, is really the only way we have short of going into the laboratory to find out what's going on. The, there are all kinds of non idealities we might not want to check, non-Gaussian noise, whether we have a nonlinear channel, uh, the effect of finite precision in some of our components in the digital signal processing, quantification noise, phase error, timing error, inter-simple interference. You know, there's all kinds of effects that we understand how they're introduced. We can numerically model them, but for which we cannot come up with a, an analytical expression for the bit error night. In uh, this simulation, we have to uh, generate two sets of random variables, the data and the noise. And typically, what we're going to generate are equiprobable bits and independent Gaussian noise. Of course, sometimes there will be other situations, and a numerical simulation also lets you examine uh, Gaussian noises, which uh, can be useful. When we run these uh, simulations, we can run the same experiment many times, and each time we can estimate the bit error rate. So how many, you know, how, how is it long enough? How do I know that I've run it long enough? Well, if I don't measure any errors, does that mean the bit error rate is zero? Or does it mean that I haven't run enough trials? Well, of course, the only way to know is to run more trials. So you run more trials. Maybe you finally get one error. Can you stop then? Is one error enough to give you a a good estimate. Somehow that doesn't feel right. You know, there's too much randomness in when that error actually happened. Is 10 enough? Is 100 enough? You know, what, what a, how do I know when I've gotten a reasonable uh, estimate? So a reasonable estimate of BER, you know, what's the criteria? 
And what we often talk about is a stopping criteria. Because if I you know, had infinite simulation power and I just ran a bazillion trials and I got a million errors, and I took it in a million divided by a bazillion, and I'm not sure what that gives, but whatever it gives me is the uh, bit error rate. Okay, I had a million errors. I probably got a pretty good estimate. But what, what happens if I, I don't have infinite computing time and, and I want to know, you know when to give up or when is good enough? And to do that, I typically use not deciding ahead of time how many trials to run, but to run trials until some criteria is met, until I can stop. And the stopping criteria is usually something like 10 to 100 errors is a typical stopping criteria in a bit error rate Monte Carlo uh, simulation. Um, also, I, I want to mention that I call these uh, numerical simulations, but actually when you go in the laboratory and you want to measure bit error rate, you're just running uh, the same uh, system, but this time uh, with hardware instead of with software. And actually you're also estimating bit error rate. So if you're running a system and you want to know how many errors do I need to know that I have run my BERT long enough to get a good estimate of the uh, bit error rate, or if I'm out offline processing a coherent detection system, how do I know that I have captured enough data to make an, an, a reliable estimate of the bit error rate? It comes to the same stopping criteria. It's the same, same uh, mathematics. That, and the good rule of thumb is between 10 and 100. 100 is better, but if you really, really can't get to 100, then 10 will give you, you know, something that's uh, uh, reasonable. So remember, applies to uh, BERT, the error rate tester measurements, and to um, coherent detection offline processing, and to numerical simulations. Okay, so just remember that we do have recourse to um, theoretical curves in that, like the homework is trying to show you, uh, you should, when you run a Monte Carlo simulation, always be validating uh, regimes of operation for which uh, equations exist and can check and see if your Monte Carlo is accurate. If I was God and I knew what the true bit error rate was known, then I would have a pretty good idea of how many trials were needed. Right? If I know that the bit error rate is about 10 to the minus 3, then if I did 10 to the 6 trials would be, you know, way more than I need. If you knew the bit error rate, you would know how many trials to run. But of course, you're running these trials because you don't know the bit error rate, so it's not really useful. Except that, well, I'll try and explain where this rule of thumb of 10 to 100 counts comes from. And it comes from posing the problem when the true bit error rate is known. Paper by Zurek Kim, Michel Zurek Kim, about uh, analysis of Monte Carlo confidence intervals. And so what you'll see in that paper is these curves. If you uh, uh, look at the curves here, what we're plotting is that in the x-axis are the total number of bits observed, so it's the number of trials in your uh, system, and on the left is the uh, bit error rate that you're going to get as an estimate when you do that many trials. And these curves are generated when the, the true probability of error, the true BR, is equal to 10 to the minus k. So here we have the true one is how we're centering our plot in our calculation. And k doesn't have to be an integer, but you know, whatever the bit error rate is, these curves, and I won't go into the derivation of the curves, it's in the paper if you're interested, but uh, what we see uh, labeled here are different confidence intervals. So if I look, for instance, at the curves for 90, 
percent confidence intervals. This gives you a uh, both the maximum and the minimum that your estimates are going to f most likely fall between or fall between with 90% likelihood. So if I were to do 10 to the k simulations and there the probability of error was 10 to the minus k, then you know these would be the bounds that with 90% probability I would my estimate would fall somewhere in that range. And so let's take another one. Let's suppose that I did 10 times as many trials as the inverse of the the probability of error. So in, if I take this example, then this is 10 times 1 over the true probability of error. And if I put a, a line here, more or less, okay, and then I looked at where uh, this intersected, I'd say, the 95% uh, curves. Oh, and, and don't draw very straight lines, but um, trust me. Oops. This is happening at about uh, two times PE. It's this point there, and about 0.5 times PE. So that means that uh, for 95% confidence that my estimate will be within a factor of 2 of the true value, I have to run about 10 times uh, more trials than the inverse of the um, true probability. Of course, the problem is that we, we don't know the true probability. Uh, obviously, that's why we're trying to estimate it. Therefore, I, I, I can't really compute how many trials I need. If I knew, I could compute it. So now we think about one approach we could use is to count errors. If I measured 10 errors, then maybe I have run about 10 times 1 over PE, right? If I ran 10 times, then the expected number of errors would be equal to 10. So suppose I count 10 errors. Well, it doesn't mean that I've actually run exactly 10 times 1 over PE, but, but it means I'm probably pretty close to this uh, confidence interval. And that's why we say that uh, you know, 10 is probably enough to get within an order of 2. But there's enough uncertainty in the stopping criteria because maybe you know, for some sequences, for some reason, I get a noise burst and all the errors occur early and then my, my estimate will actually be very different because it's not exactly equal to the uh, expectation over infinite runs. Say that there's more error involved in this prediction which is based on when you know what the true bit error rate is. So it's not as good as 95% but it gives you still at least some quantitative feel for how much better you're doing uh, when you're using this, this number. So this is where you get this rule of thumb. <laughs> 